Welcome everyone um, to this uh, info session from the dream.us on what colleges can do to support the mental health of undocumented students. This webinar is geared towards anyone who works with these, these students in a non-clinical setting. I'm Tanya Wilcox, I'm one of the program directors at the dream.us and I manage the scholar and college programs um, here. The dream.us is the nation's largest college access and success program for undocumented students. We currently serve over 3,700 students attending 70 of our partner colleges across the nation. And we also have graduated about 800 um, dreamers. Joining me today, we have Elizabeth Hernandez. So go ahead to the next slide, Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth Hernandez brings a wealth of experience working with this population, as you can see in the slide. She is currently a staff psychologist at UCLA, and she's also our wellness advisor. And a little word on our wellness advisor. Um, our scholars may call Elizabeth when they're um, needing some information about mental health or in a moment of distress. And her role is overall to calm the student down and to help the student develop an action plan of one or two things that they can do to help themselves. And um, that could include contacting one of the mental health liaisons on one of your campuses if you're one of our partner colleges. Um, besides Elizabeth, we have other, two other great presenters. We have two um, of our advisors at two of our partner colleges, Kevin Noriega, and um, Kevin will also be joined by Trinette Fonseca, who come from Delaware State. Um, Kevin is our scholar advisor, and Trinette works in the counseling department at Delaware. And joining them is Maribel Sanchez, who is also the scholar advisor at Eastern Connecticut State University. So um, before we start, let me give you a little sense of what today's agenda will be. Um, so after this introduction, uh, we're gonna spend uh, just a few minutes giving you some data that comes from a survey that um, our scholars took. Then um, Elizabeth's gonna talk a little bit about the signs of distress that students can um, show and how to respond to those signs. And um, then uh, Delaware State and Eastern will present some of the effective practices that they're putting in place on their campuses, and then we'll finish up with sharing some resources for you. Uh, please know that this presentation is being recorded and the PowerPoint is being shared with you right now in the chat box. We will share it again at the end of the webinar and we will send you a recording and again the PowerPoint in a couple of days. Um, as we go through the presentation, feel free to um, put your questions in the question and um, uh, answer box. We will take uh, questions uh, throughout the webinar. And um, you can also raise your hand on your bar. You'll see a little hand. You can raise that if you want to speak during the webinar. Um, so let's start by doing uh, two quick polls. So um, Sadana, why don't you go ahead and um, ask the first poll, uh, so please audience. Tell us, do you feel you would be able to identify the signs and symptoms of common mental health issues in students? We'll give you a few seconds to fill that question. So we have about half of you have voted so far. We'll give you five more seconds to uh, get others given us an answer. And we're so excited to um, have you all join us because this is such a big issue for undocumented students. So why don't we go ahead and close the poll, Sadana, and show the results and share the results. Um, okay, great. So um, many of you, most of you uh, can identify those signs. So that's great for you, to Elizabeth, to know. Um, and then let's do the second poll. Let's, let's go ahead, there you go. So please tell us um, what, some strategy, what are some of the strategies that you use to help students access mental health services? And um, when we close this poll, I know Elizabeth, I'm gonna turn it over to Elizabeth because I know she's gonna start talking to you about some, about some of these strategies based on the results of this poll. Okay. 
Great. Just a couple more seconds. Please keep voting. Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll and share the results. So Donna and Elizabeth, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you for joining us today. So you can start talking a little bit about this results and take over the presentation. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. Um, so I can see here that uh, many of you actually uh, employed a lot of these um, different strategies. So whether it's walking a student over, um, calling a mental health provider that you know, um, even, you know, addressing concerns around stigma, which is really exciting uh, to hear, actually. Um, and I think the, the next uh, most common is reminding students that they can change providers. So really empowering students to um, kind of take charge of their care. Uh, so these are all great strategies. It's, it's exciting to hear that you all are already doing a lot of this great work. So some of this might actually then um, hopefully just be validating, right? Um, and then we'll get to hear what some of you all are doing. Um, so let's get started. So first let's find out, before we go into what students are distressed, you know, what are some of the signs of distress? Let's first find out what students are distressed about, right? Um, so scholars uh, told us that they are most anxious about legal status or immigration status and economic security. So 90%, you know, uh, mentioned that they're sometimes to always anxious about these issues. Um, they're also really anxious about the safety of their family members, right? With 81% saying they're sometimes to always anxious about it. And around half of scholars are anxious about other issues such as you can see the other options traveling across state lines or housing and food insecurity. And this data is really consistent with what we're seeing uh, nationally. Um, so this, you know, this is really consistent and I think students are, are really reflecting here um, what, we, what we've, you know, what the research is showing nationally. Um, in, in this slide, you can see that 69% of the students noted that they feel lonely, either sometimes, frequently, or always. So social isolation is a big one. Um, there's also worries about um, sleep, so sleep issues, sometimes, frequently, or always. So a majority of them experiencing uh, sleep issues. And then a good amount of them, 36%, worry that they might do something they regret. So this is really in reference to impulsivity, which is something I hear a lot about, you know, doing things that then they later regret and then that causing a lot of like guilt and, um, and shame. Uh, and then lastly, you know, the, the data I think that is the most interesting and maybe even most concerning is that despite, you know, um, a large amount of students indicating distress or that they're open to seeking uh, treatment, um, they actually, you know, a majority of them actually say they, they're only 23% actually um, is actually seeing or seeking mental health treatment. So I think there's a gap there. And that gap, I think I would, I would even, um, you know, to note is that that gap is actually wider than among the general population. So I think that disproportionately, um, we'll see, we're seeing that our students are not accessing care, even when they are open to it, even when, you know, they're noting that I have seen one in the past or I'm, I'm actually seeing one, um, only a few of them are actually um, accessing the service. So before I go into what the signs of distress are, I, I want us to all, and, and to really like honor the, the wisdom and the knowledge that we already have, right? We all know when someone we care about, someone we know is in distress. And that's because of the relationship that we have with that person, right? We just have a feeling there's, sometimes they're very unique to that person, what those signs are. Um, and so when we work with students that maybe we don't know that well, or we haven't developed that relationship, we can, we ourselves as providers can become really anxious about how am I gonna know that this particular student who I've never met before or who I've only met a few times 
is distressed. And so that's really the purpose um, of, this, uh, of this particular section of the presentation. Um, but I, I do want us to kind of ground ourselves in the wisdom and knowledge that we all have and, and our ability, especially as helpers and in the helping profession and the student services you know, profession, that we all are actually really skilled in recognizing these signs, in, especially in people that we know. And so to really kind of anchor ourselves in that skill set. Um, but the signs of distress really range from cognitive to behavioral all the way to like, you know, emergency, uh, sort of like more urgent uh, signs of distress that can be, you know, um, maybe even warrant like a higher level of care. So the first, uh, the first section is about cognitive distress. So cognitive refers to, we're talking about, you know, odd beliefs and feelings that might um, really impair someone's ability to be in reality, make, you know, good decisions. So inappropriate, bizarre, or strange behavior, um, really extreme emotionality, um, agitation or restlessness, uh, hyperactivity, and all of this would be not just on it in and of itself, but really that it would it would show up as a real change in the person's like you know typical behavior. Um, so if the person's always been like this, maybe you know when they come to you, you're not that concerned because they're typically and consistently exhibiting some of these uh, these uh, behaviors or then you might not be as worried, but this would, you would be especially worried if someone was really presenting very differently to you. Um, another one would be like if they are really struggling with attention and memory. So even in a conversation, talking to someone and noticing like they're really not um, paying attention, they're really not um, taking in the information. They seem to have these like sort of moments where they seem to be somewhere else, right? Um, easily distracted, right? Uh, speech impairment, uh, confused, disjointed thoughts, that's a really major sign of distress. Um, sometimes, you know, nonsensical speech, you know, so a student will talk to you and you're like, what did they just say? Or their story's not making any sense, or they're, they're very tangential, they're going from one topic to another, they're jumping around. Um, or they get easily distracted, something that they're talking about makes them think of this other thing and they go off into this other story, right? Um, and of course, we all know this one, paranoia or suspiciousness. So a student really recounting in their narrative a lot of uh, worry that others are out to get them, that others are against them, and it just starts to really seem like it's really unlikely that all of these things are true, right? And then the next area is behavioral. So this is where maybe you see like a change in hygiene and usually that change is like, it could be both a decline, meaning um, they go from, you know, having really like appropriate grooming to, you know, looking like they never, they haven't gotten out of bed in a few days and maybe they have like a strong odor, um, their hair is really disheveled. They really look, you know, like a real decline in their, in their hygiene. But it could also be, um, something it could be the opposite it could be someone who typically um is you know groomed appropriately and all of a sudden they have like a full like face of makeup and you know maybe just like really provocative clothing um and so you're just wanting to just note the change not so much uh in particular something specific but um noticing that oh this is different than when you came in last time right if they're consistently disheveled or consistently fatigued, that's definitely worrisome because then you might want to think about whether this person is, you know, taking care of their basic needs, right? And especially if it's like, seems like it's been a while that they've been uh, dealing with this. Um, you know, fatigue, lethargy, lack of energy, falling asleep in public, these could all be signs. Obviously not in and of themselves because especially college students who are really, uh, their sleep habits are questionable, right? Um, but thinking about, are they, you know, is it so bad? Did they just have one bad night and they, you know, didn't get any sleep? Or is it consistently every time they meet with you, they just seem like really excessively tired and you, you find it almost hard to believe that they'd be 
you know, able to function in, in, and pay attention and concentrate in class, right? Um, disruptive behavior, aggressive, angry, or threatening behavior. So those are the more obvious ones. Dramatic weight gain or, or, uh, or weight loss. That would mean that you'd really have to have seen them multiple times, right, over a period of time. And then any obvious use of mood altering substances. This one can be a hard one too to detect, right? And then lastly, the last area is really about stress, um, you know, signs of self-harm or suicide. So whether they're, they're verbally telling you about, you know, um, thoughts of harming themselves, not wanting to live anymore, like really severe hopelessness, um, or it's, you know, maybe they wrote a note, maybe in their email, maybe in sometimes professors will will say that in their essays were particularly hopeless or, or seemed pretty like passively suicidal. Um, those are definitely signs. If they start to really isolate from folks, um, you know, they mention like, oh, I haven't been going home for like the past couple months. I haven't been hanging out with my friends, things like that. Um, you know, a really recurring uh, sign of pessimism about the future. So no matter what you say, no matter your, despite your efforts, they really are um, unable to, to, to be optimistic about the future. That can be a sign. Um, certainly giving away valuables. We know the research shows that that can be a, a sign of an impending or plan to commit suicide. And then of course, uh, preparing for death. So, you know, really making like overt efforts to prepare to end, to end your life. Those are all more urgent signs that would really require us to respond a lot quicker. So what, what do we do when we, you know, we, we suspect or it's very clear to us that a student is in distress, right? You all had mentioned some of the, the strategies that you already use, that you've already, um, you know, employed. Um, but I, you know, I think what's been really helpful uh, for us in, in these situations, especially for those of you who are working with students nonstop, maybe don't even have control of who's coming through the door, and you feel you're, in, in many ways, you're more vulnerable. Uh, some of the things you can think about doing is really, you know, coming from a place of assuming the best in others, right? So assuming that if a person is distressed, that they have a reason to be distressed, right? Um, if there's an issue and maybe they're coming and wanting to provide negative feedback or maybe they're even um, a little bit provocative and they're coming up, you know, complaining about something. And if there's anything that you can acknowledge um, or maybe something that you really um, can own as, as something that, you know, you can take credit for, I think that can be helpful in de-escalating. Um, it's important to understand that when a student comes to you that we really focus on the student first, right? And not focus on the issue because I think we can get caught up in the details of the issue and forget that they're just a student who's maybe having like a really emotional reaction, right? And maybe the, the best thing to do is just to calm the student down and then we can get to a place where we can problem solve, right? Um, the other thing we can think about is encourage a student to talk by, you know, listening really closely and really patiently. So what that means is just not jumping too quickly to problem solving, um, really asking like follow up questions, um, really taking the time to make sure you understand what they're saying. So sometimes when they're when someone's in distress, they're not really clear when they're speaking. And so it's important to just slow them down and show them, you know, let me, let me actually take the time to make sure I understand you. Maybe even just repeating back to them, like, this is what I'm hearing. Am I right? Is that what you're saying? Let me just make sure. Um, I think students really appreciate that, um, you know, that, that you're really showing them and conveying that you understand the situation, right? I, you know, another strategy is aligning with the student. So acknowledging their feelings, you know, validating their situation, especially if they're complaining about like systemic issues that you yourself understand to be true. It's always helpful to, to really align with that 
um, because I think that can make it easier to gain the student's trust and really get them to tell you if there's a real reason to be worried about the student and if they need a higher level of care, right? Um, and then, you know, if a student is really reporting things that are that are really concerning, that seem, you know, in a, at a higher level, whether it's paranoia, maybe, um, you know, something that just seems really unreal and, and unlikely, um, to make sure that you connect them to a higher level of care, right? So that you don't take that on as something that's part of your job, but actually send them to the appropriate referral source, right? Now, if they, you know, are in, in some danger, if they put you in danger, I always like to, you know, have the, ca the caveat that our safety comes first, right? As helpers, I think we, we tend to want to jump in, we want to be professional, we want to problem solve, we want to put the students first. But really, if we don't feel safe, if a student is maybe being very disruptive to others and impacting a large amount of students, let's say in, an, in a lobby area um, because they're too loud or, you know, it is important that, and I hope we give ourselves permission to really take the time to make sure that we're safe, right? Um, and unless there's imminent risk, we want to slow down and assess, right? Really make sure that we understand what's going on, that we're clear about the risk if there is risk, right? Um, we do want to reduce stimulation. So if there's a lot of noise, maybe if the doors open and there's a lot of distractions, maybe closing the door. If you don't feel safe, I don't recommend, you know, putting yourself in a physical situation where you can't get out safely or you don't have access to the phone to keep yourself safe and call for help, right? If you're alone and you don't feel comfortable being alone with a student, you know, just making sure that you yourself are finding support. I would also even add that um, it's okay to not do it alone. If you don't feel comfortable and you really, it's, it's amazing what can happen when two helping professionals get together and support a student. The student actually feels more supported than less. Um, so you'd be surprised. Sometimes we worry, like we don't want to involve other people's, other people in the situation. We want to protect the student's privacy, but really the, it can also communicate a lot of care and support, right? We do want to protect their self-esteem um, and make sure that we're not increasing feelings of shame and rage because that really is what can at the underlying causes the, the distress, right? We want to communicate um, information and be really transparent about what we're doing. So if we are calling for help, letting them know, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to call this person. We're going to talk about this and, and really be clear about the intention. And I think that helps students feel in control. Um, always making sure we're providing choices um, so that students are feeling empowered, right? Um, and then working towards outlining like concrete steps, like this is what we're going to do. Even if you're not 100% sure, even the step being, I'm going to find out more information so that I can be helpful, right? And then of course, if you have to set limits, like I said, to either keep yourself safe, keep other students safe, um, to really give yourself permission to do that and understand that it's in order to really de-escalate a situation, you're going to want to have good boundaries, right? So, you know, we now, we know that what students are worried about. We know what distresses students. We, we have some idea of some ways that we can de-escalate and diffuse a student who is distressed or distressing to others, right? But I think before we even step into feeling confident in doing this work, I think it's important for us to, to reflect on what are some of the reactions that we have when students disclose really distressing information, right? How does it make us feel when they give us really heavy content or they're really emotional um, or they're really disclosing really private information that you're not sure like, okay, what am I gonna do with this information now, right? And so these are just some common reactions that you know oftentimes we'll have and some of the then reactions that we have and then what we end up doing that can kind of make things worse right and so oftentimes we'll feel helpless we'll feel like i don't know what i i just feel like i'm i can't help this person um and that can really get in our way and so 
it's helpful to just be really clear about what your role is and what you can do and be 100% comfortable that the little that you can do, even if it feels little to you, can be really huge and like transformative to someone else and really communicate a lot of care, right? We talked a lot about before the making sure we're not jumping into problem solve, um, making sure that we're not just focusing on one identity of a, of a student, that we're really thinking and considering all the different ways that their experience is impacting them. Um, you know, sometimes we want to be really strengths-based and emphasize only the positive, but that can also be invalidating. So it's kind of like a tricky balance that we have to, you know, carry. Um, and sometimes we just make mistakes and we, you know, we'll say things that are inappropriate that, um, that can be really offensive and it's important for us to be able to recognize it if someone calls our attention to it, to be able to own it um, and really not get defensive, right? And then of course, this is one that I really struggle with. Um, we worry about students and sometimes students come to us and we get anxious, we get wrapped up in their anxiety. Um, so to really kind of take care of ourselves when that happens so that we can be helpful, right? Another thing that's important to think about is, you know, this community is a, is a diverse community. Um, there's a growing diversity actually within the community despite what visibly might seem like a majority Latinx community. Um, it's important for us to note that our Asian and Black undocumented students really face unique barriers when accessing mental health, whether it's because of a lot of invisibility within the Asian community in particular, um, a lack of a common language, um, especially in the Asian communities when it comes to being able to organize and have a lot of visibility in the community. Um, there's a lot of history of you know, sy systemic oppression, um, mistrust of authorities and anti-Blackness um, for our Black undocumented students and even among our communities of color, right? And so anti-Blackness is not just a a white and black thing, but really um, even within the community, oftentimes our students will feel isolated within the community. And so for us to really take that into consideration when students are coming to us with distress, right? Um, some immigrant groups also, you know, like I mentioned, experience within group oppression just based on their immigration status. So they're even less likely to, to come out and seek services. This is particularly true for our Asian undocumented students. Um, there is a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment within the Asian community. So even within their own circles, you'll, you'll see that they might even feel more comfortable disclosing with someone who's not a similar identity as them because of the shame and stigma, right? Another thing to consider is that immigrant students may have concerns about how their immigration status or the immigration status of their loved ones is documented. Um, and so, you know, to be one thing that can be very helpful are in our roles is that we can really be transparent about how we document what the privacy limits are. And even when we make a referral, what their privacy limits are to be very clear. Um, it's okay to disclose this with this person because this is what their rules are. And that can be really, um, alleviate a lot of stress and concern. And then lastly, you know, referring to counseling effectively, right? So if it becomes clear that a student really needs a higher level of care, really needs to connect to mental health services, you really want to, you know, understand that there's a lot of mental health stigma, right? In the community, particularly among our immigrant students, and I would argue even worse with our undocumented students, right? whether it's, I can't seek mental health services because if I tell them some of the stressors I'm going through, they are all mandated reporters, maybe they're going to separate my family, they're gonna get my family deported if they report abuse or anything like that, right? And so really understanding that the mistrust of immigrant communities and mental health and medical providers is actually really historically based, right? There is a lot of history and incidents where you know, the medical profession and mental health has abused people of color, immigrant communities. It's happening now at the borders, right? So to really understand that all of that really does kind of feed into and contribute to the stigma. So to validate 
this, the concerns, but at the same time, try to make the case, right, for why this could be helpful. Um, so considering students' cultural background, considering that even gender issues like, you know, is, is a female or male student feel comfortable talking to me? Um, you know, is a student who's significantly younger, if I'm significantly older, there might be like issues of respect that they might not be actually as comfortable telling me, actually, I don't want what you're asking. They might just be like, you know, F, very deferential. And so to just to kind of take note of some of these, um, you know, uh, these processes, right? And even just body language, right? Some, maybe they'll avoid contact and that's not a sign that they're, they don't like you or they're not listening, but really it's just like um, a cultural thing, right? To just kind of be clear about that. And if you're curious and you're not sure, you can just kind of know, name that and ask. Um, you know, finding out if counselors are trained, uh, you know, I think that reminding students that the counselors and therapists are trained in multicultural psychology, right? And that they are not limited just to Western um, mental health, you know, theoretical orientations, but that they also can incorporate faith-based, indigenous and alternative healing practices into their therapy so that students can really feel like, okay, this, I can relate to this. This is something that I, I would be open to. Um, we really want to think about, uh, you know, what are, what are the ways and how can referral sources or, you know, mental health services, when we refer to them, how can this be beneficial to a student? Well, for some students, it's really just about prevention. And so knowing, okay, what are some good prevention resources? For other students, it's they need to be, you know, seen right away. And this is more of a, you know, reactive kind of treatment. Um, for others, it's, um, you know, understanding maybe they can talk to someone who can connect them to other resources that I'm just not as aware of. So whether it's case management services, counseling services, um, if you're connected to religious leaders or indigenous healing practitioners in the community or even on campus to connect students, if that feels what's appropriate. There's also a great wealth of community organizations like Al-Anon, legal services, social services that students could access that could really be very relieving of their distress actually without having to go to mental health and then of course you know for those students who really are maybe still ambivalent about connecting national hotlines right um, and I think some states even have like state hotlines there's more local hotlines as well maybe your campus has a hotline so knowing what are those resources right now I'm going to open it up to any questions because I know I threw a lot of information out at you there is a question, Elizabeth, and please feel free to keep asking questions in the question and um, answer box or the chat box. Um, uh, this question comes um, from Tania Cabrera, and um, she asks, students have concerns that sharing too much uh, information in counseling may be used against them in court. How do we encourage them to seek evaluation that may possibly assist them for a pathway to residency or citizenship. Yes, and so this, this is actually really relevant, um, especially with the latest news about the psychotherapy notes being shared, right? Um, with, and, and used against, uh, especially folks that are in detention. Um, I think it's important that students know that yes, when you do get a psychological evaluation, once you disclose the information, the, the, the professional cannot uh, pretend like you didn't disclose it. Like you can't really like pretend you didn't hear it, right? Um, and so what you wanna do is empower students to ask a lot of questions about confidentiality and how things are documented. Um, so that they can really be, they can make the choice whether they wanna disclose something or not, right? So when I practice, um, I take my time with students to really let them know, this is what I'm mandated to report. These, would, these are some examples, do you have any questions? Um, this is what confidentiality, confidentiality really looks like. Um, you know, if you're a danger to yourself, 
if you're a danger to others, I might have to break confidentiality. Here are some examples if they need them, right? But to be very, very transparent about what are the situations that might warrant me having to break confidentiality. And in terms of like what information could be used against a, a student later, if, especially if um, maybe they're seeing a professional, a mental health professional to do a psychological evaluation that's gonna be included in an immigration case. So what's important to note, what I do, I do those uh, here at UCLA, um, and I meet with the attorney. So I'm already knowing like, what's the question? What are we trying to assess for? And so then I'm also directing my questions around this particular issue so that other things don't come into the report that are not necessary. Like, yes, they're true in facts, but they're not really important to this case and could then be used to like deny, us, deny someone because something, you know, let's say like substance use is a really common one. Um, so I really do warn my students um, to be very careful with using uh, substances that are not legal at the federal level. So yes, maybe you live in a state where a certain substance is legal, but if it's not federally, then that can be used against you. Even something like a social media post of you using, you know, can be used against you. Um, so I'm very clear with students about that. Um, and if they are using, I, I really discourage them from using. Um, that would be one example. So substance use is one that we've heard historically, um, you know, anything where a student is disclosing committing a crime might, you know, be used against a student. So those are the things that we can empower students not to disclose so that it doesn't get into the report if that's something that then is going to, um, you know, if they're, they're willingly signing off permission to disclose um, their report to, to help their immigration case. Can, you know, records be subpoenaed? Yes, they can. That's very rare that without a student's permission, you know, um, a court would order uh, mental health uh, records to be included as part of the decision making. It's very rare, but it can happen. And, and you know, given that times are changing and laws are changing all the time, uh, it is something to consider, something to be cautious about, but it is something that you can, you know, just empower students to ask a lot of questions to make sure that they understand the, what the potential consequences can be. Okay, thanks Elizabeth. Um, one more question and then let's turn it over very quickly to um, the pre other presenters. And does a seeking mental health services impact students' petitions for U visas? Do you know that Elizabeth? If, can you repeat that? Does seeking mental health services impact students' petitions for U visas or I guess any other visa? Yes, I, 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 I think it does impact in a positive way. So usually U visa cases um, on their own, you know, the only requisite for being, you know, you have to be a victim of a crime and you have to have proof that you collaborated with law enforcement um, in solving the crime. Those are the only two requirements for um, a U visa. If you have proof that you then have had mental health consequences or that that, you know, being the victim of the crime has caused some mental distress and you have proof of that, you have a diagnosis, maybe you've been connected to treatment, that all just helps the case and strengthens the case. It doesn't take away from it at all. Um, again, unless, like I said earlier, there's, um, you know, substance use that then calls into question whether that was a crime or, you know, anything that really then taints the, the story a little bit, then I, I can say that seeking mental health treatment can, can hurt a client more than and help. Um, but it's very rare. I would say the opposite. Usually U visa cases are strengthened by seeking psychological evaluation and assessment to really kind of make the case for this crime and experiencing this crime was very traumatic and I've experienced some distress as a result of it. Right, so let's go ahead um, and have uh, our Kevin and uh, Trinette. Hi, everyone. Hello. 
Go ahead, we can hear you, Kevin. Okay. So hi, uh, everyone. My name is Kevin Oriega from Delaware State University, and I have my, my colleague here, uh, Mr. Ne Fonseca from the Counseling Department. And today we're going to share with you some of the effective pra uh, practices that we have put into place uh, for the 147 dreamers that we have here at DSU. And I'm going to start with uh, Trinette. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Trinette Fonseca. I work within the uh, Delaware State University Counseling Department. I'm actually their coordinator. Um, and within the counseling department, we have three licensed counselors and an MSW along with myself. Usually uh, on a, day, a weekly or so basis, we see about anywhere from, I would say 50 to 100 students per week, pretty much. Is that, is that? We have a peer counselor program out of that and basically our peer counselors consists of 15 uh, students and their main objective for the peer students is to basically have them do outreach, that component where they provide support and information and they then in turn refer the student body into the counseling center. And going back to group counseling, I wanna speak a little bit about what uh, we have done with regards to community to mental health counselors through fundraising and awareness presentations that I've done throughout the state of Delaware, I've had the opportunity to network with, um, I had the opportunity to network with a Delaware uh, licensed mental health counselor. And, uh, and this tells you the importance of, of creating significant uh, connections with all the people in your area. We were able to host a uh, group counseling session for the dreamers um, I hosted the sessions at the very beginning of the semester because I wanted my dreamers to have the knowledge, the information, and the tools to apply them as soon as possible. Uh, we did uh, the group sessions for two weeks, one at 6 p.m. and the other one at, se uh, at 7. Um, the, the licensed counselor, she capped the sessions to 12 students, and her reason was because in order for her tools and the information sharing and the knowledge to, in order to be shared effectively. Um, she wanted the sessions to be capped at 12, maximum uh, 15. Some of my, uh, my dreamers at DSU continue the communication with the uh, licensed health counselor. Uh, in addition to that, as you guys saw in the, in the uh, presentation, we saw that sleep is also an issue amongst the um, on, uh, undocumented student population. So I connected with Dr. Megan Walls from the Moors, and she actually had been coming to campus since the program first started back in the fall 2016 and, and has done presentations uh, regarding the area of sleep and, and how to make sure we're, we're effective when, 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 when it comes to sleep and how to make it work for us, especially for, um, for college students. And then we got workshops. Okay. Um, throughout, through, in collaboration with a few on-campus groups, we collaborate and offer a lot of different workshops that vary throughout the semester, such as uh, with NYU, there was a screening called uh, for a movie or a film, a short film that was called The Rest of Us, and it focused on suicide. Um, then there was, uh, or upcoming there is, and we've had this in the fall semester as well, uh, Puppy Day, where we collaborate once again with um, ASPCA and the Humane Society. Puppies come on campus, students get to connect with them. There are more and more students who are actually asking for support animals. So this is one way we can connect them with a resource to do so. Um, we offer of uh, paint workshops, which they can, you know, for those who are not into writing or speaking, they can just, you know, pretty much paint it out or draw it out. And that's usually offered during their common hour on a Tuesday or Thursday. Um, in addition, there's um, fun activities that come up and it involves Stop the Stigma. So they actually get to do a physical activity and awareness, the information that they're given at the end is pretty much more so focusing on awareness of mental health and stopping the stigma that's around it. 
Um, then there's smaller workshops, which would include like post-graduation depression. So that workshop would also fo focus in on um, discussing what are their plans and addressing those anxieties to, um, after graduation. Um, another workshop offered throughout the semester is what to do when anxiety attacks. Uh, Self-care 101, that is, once again, that discusses um, the importance of self-care, different ways to um, apply it, relieve stress, anxiety, and depression. There's also mediation, meditation, sorry, meditation and yoga, um, which is also held in the counseling department and sometimes in the wellness center. There's another workshop offered throughout the semester called Battling Depression. So that also focuses on how to identify signs and symptoms of depression from a minimal level, not like a professional level, but a, a minimal level. And um, how to manage your anger, with, we will cover that in zero to 100 real quick. So that, that workshop focuses on um, managing your anger as, you know, for on a student level. And let's move forward to personal conversations. Let's move forward to personal conversations. So you will notice that if you have established a very positive uh, relationship with your undocumented students, you will notice that they will start opening up a lot with regards to the challenges, uh, especially mental health challenges that, that they're going through. Well, that is the case with me. So what I've done, and I think this has been very, very beneficial, not only uh, to create life-changing habits for my students, but also it will lead to an improvement in, in their academic performance. I, depending on the conversation, depending uh, on the connection that the student and I have at the moment of, of, of talking, I set up weekly and bi-weekly follow-up uh, follow meetings. And again, they, they, they have demonstrated for me uh, to be extremely beneficial uh, because I'm not only tackling the changing of bad habits, I'm not only tackling uh, your, your, your thought process, how, how you view your challenges, how you view joy and, and happiness in life, I'm tackling also their academics. And also, I want to move forward to changing the environment. You know, sometimes the office, for at least for me, the office is fine, but I've, I've, I've noticed that when we provide the students with a change of ambience or a change of environment, let's walk around campus, let's, let's grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Sometimes that allows the students to sit back and relax a little more and, and, and become more comfortable with you and create more of a, strong, uh, a stronger connection with the student. Now this one, with regards to change the environment, you have to be careful because you have to make sure that it is fit and safe, not only for the student, but also for ourselves. And I also want to come back to the follow up meetings. Do not forget to document the meetings while always keeping in mind the sensitivity of their uh, immigration status. Do you have anything um, about personal conversations? Um, personal conversations. So, with, I mean, within the counseling department, they usually, um, those who do seek counseling and do partner with their assigned counselor. They actually do see them either weekly or bi-weekly. Um, they're always reminded that the count sessions are strictly confidential and that basically what will, you know, their information is safe in, within the counseling department. And their visits for, for us pretty much are unlimited. I mean, sometimes we see students from the time they attend, begin BSU till up until graduation. So it's not, you know, there are no set you know, one time or 11 times, we actually, sometimes we get them for the whole four years. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, moving forward to the mental health survey, survey, I'm working in collaboration with uh, faculty members, part of the sociology and, and psychology department, in addition to two dreamers, to roll out a survey that is going to be focused on the mental health, particularly for the dreamers at, at Delaware State University. The survey includes uh, sociological and, and psychological survey methods. Once it is approved by IRB, we're going to distribute that to, to all the dreamers at DSU this semester and next semester in the fall. And we're really looking at, you know, what mental health changes and challenges do dreamers at DSU experience, 
not only in general, uh, uh, generally speaking, but also after two major events that are coming up, which is the Supreme Court decision on DACA, as well as the uh, per, uh, pres uh, presidential elections. So once we collect the data, we're going to assess it, we're going to identify what are, what are some of the changes and, and the challenges for DREAMers at DSU pertaining to, to mental health, and then we're going to work on determining what potential resolution we can put into place so we can tackle those, uh, those challenges. And finally, creating connections with religious congregations. Uh, once again, I want to uh, re uh, reiterate and emphasize the importance of creating significant and, and effective connections with individuals near your area. So for example, I was able to make a very positive connection with a reverend and, and a pastor near our area here in, uh, in Delaware. And they have helped, they have helped the program you know, our, our dreamers, not only with the religious aspect of it being considered they're so they're away from home, but he, they have also become such an instrumental part in regards to the support of uh, mental health. Uh, this uh, connection, this, re, uh, this relationship that I have with the Reverend and Pastor has also led to the financial support of our dreamers, which as we know, uh, is, 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 is another challenge that, that uh, they experience. Thank you very much for your time. And now, okay, I'm sorry, let's pass it over to Maribel from Eastern Connecticut State University. Thank you, Kevin, you almost forgot about me. <laughs> Hello, my name is Maribel um, Sanchez. I am the Scholar Advisor at Eastern Connecticut State University. We are located in Willimantic, Connecticut. Um, small little town. Uh, we're about 40 minutes away from a major city um, and our closest major city is Hartford, Connecticut. So I want to piggyback off of um, pretty much off of what our um, my counterparts basically said and I don't want to continue to reiterate. I know we're running short on time. Um, my school is in Eastern Connecticut State University is in Willimantic, Connecticut. Just saw the question. Um, so one of the things that we, so I've been working with um, Dream.us scholars here on our campus for four years. Um, one of the biggest um, strategies that are, have been super effective for our scholars, we have about 205 scholars here, um, both national and opportunity scholars. Um, so one-on-one -on -one and group therapy. Um, we have a pretty extensive um, counseling center. We go, we call them CAPS. It's Counseling and Psychological Services. Um, we have five counselors, licensed counselors, one psychiatrist, which is a prescriber, and um, two post-grad um, fellows, and three um, counseling, um, counseling trainees. Um, which are usually uh, students at, you know, local college. Um, so we have a pretty uh, big staff of folks in our counseling and psychological services. Um, and we have collaborated with one of our counselors. Her name is AC Neal. And um, so me and her actually devised a group therapy just specifically for undocumented students here on our campus, which is really successful for a couple of years. This year, this past fall, it kind of, um, our attendance kind of dropped in um, our group therapy. Um, and so we're kind of taking a step back this semester to really evaluate, um, like, you know, why uh, we had such low attendance. <clears throat> One of the and another effective practice is actually collaboration. So other than collaborating with our counseling and psychological services on our campuses, on our campus, um, we also collaborate with the wellness center. I know I heard Kevin um, mention that as well. The wellness center has been pretty integral in um, really providing um, specific programming to undocumented students here on our campus. Um, you know, yoga, aromatherapy, uh, art, um, like an art therapy. Uh, there were so many other things. Other, I was telling the folks that the other day they were making um, candles and as a form of like stress relief. So all these like really cool 
um, out of the box kind of things that help to ease anxiety within our students. <clears throat> Here at Eastern, we're a pretty small school, so um, it's, you're pretty hard pressed to uh, find uh, somebody who doesn't have contact with an undocumented student here on our campus. Um, we communicate pretty regularly in terms of me communicate with, communicating with housing, communicating with student life, um, communicating with faculty members. Um, if we see a student that's kind of in distress and maybe a uh, faculty member doesn't really know if this student is undocumented, um, but kind of suspects, uh, a lot of times uh, I'll get a phone call uh, asking me to maybe check in on this student and really not even um, saying that they're assuming that the student is um, undocumented, but kind of saying like, hey, maybe you should check in on this student. I know they know you, <laughs> which is, I, I have almost 300 students. So um, we also have a tell somebody, it's called tell somebody, which is an online incident reporting tool that we have that is, um, that's made up of, um, it's like a response team. So we, the folks that are, um, that are assigned to that team are folks from CAPS, which is our Counseling and Psychological Services, a person from um, our Dean of Student, um, our Dean of Students, um, our conduct person, also somebody from housing. Um, so it's kind of like this, um, you know, well-rounded circle that if a faculty member or staff member sees a student like that is in distress or kind of looks like a little off and it's, they're super concerned about them. So they would put in, um, they would call or, excuse me, they would submit a uh, tell somebody report. And, and then, you know, the student response team, the response team will get right on response, responding to um, that report. Um, something that I believe in personally is really intrusive advising. Um, I've been known to, if you are, not um, responding to my emails or not responding to my phone calls. I have been known to run knock on your door in your residence hall and just check in on you to make sure that you're okay. Um, you know, I'm not afraid to meet a student um, where they are. Basically kind of piggybacking off of what Kevin said, both figuratively and, and mentally, because some students don't even you know, they're in those early stages of not even recognizing what's happening with them in terms of their mental health. Um, and so, and so figuratively, right? Like I'm going to their residence hall, I'm meeting them for coffee, I'm getting outside of the office. I know we're running short on time, Tanya, so I just want to be respectful of that. Yes, we only have um, resources that we want to share with you, um, but we will stay on for another five minutes just to uh, maybe give you a couple of questions. And there's, I know that um, at Eastern Maribel, you are doing um, or preparing to do some responses once the uh, Supreme Court decision comes. And there's a question around that is either Delaware or Eastern providing any other legal evaluation or other services to students when the Supreme Court decision comes out. Yes, so um, we have we have what we're calling like a DACA response team, which is made up of all you know people, uh, all these you know the admins from um, our university, and within that we have we have solidified um, a local a local community um, organization which has um, a mobile legal van. And so that's something that we have solidified and are basically have in our back pocket. And we're actually providing a, a legal workshop for our scholars. We have done already um, several Know Your Rights workshops. We've also done um, UndocuPeer trainings. Just recently we had another UndocuPeer training for all of our faculty and staff on campus. And um, all of our counseling and psychological service uh, folks here on campus have gone through and then DocuPeer training. So I saw a question on there about um, the counselors being pe people of color. And so not all of our counselors in our um, counseling center, right, are people of color. And so being sensitive to that, it, but they have gone through um, UndocuPeer training. So um, I think they have left those trainings really feeling a little bit more comfortable um, 
addressing, uh, you know, undocumented student concerns. Uh, so also uh, going back to in response to DACA, yes. So we have a, a team basically ready um, and we have been doing pre, um, so that we're not reactive, right? So we've been trying to be, um, do other things beforehand to prepare, um, providing campus community things so that the campus knows what's going on. So even if you're not undocumented, you know what DACA is, you know what not having DACA, um, you know, what, what it can mean for these students if they lose DACA. So, yeah. So, and um, at Delaware State University, I've also made a connection with a, a, a local organization that focuses on immigration issues. All of their services are uh, for free. And actually one of their, their, their main associates of the local organization have come every year to Delaware State University to do presentations about what is DACA, what are, what are some of the benefits, limitations, what can you do? And also to provide resources of some of uh, legal attorneys that can help them in that process of asylum or to become a uh, legal permanent resident. We also work with the University General Council, um, which is highly involved with the program as well as the, the Office of the President. Um, I have done professional developments in regards to how to best serve the undocumented students at Delaware State University. And it was open to faculty, staff, and um, student as well. Delaware State University also has a DACA student organization and they also assist me in the process of increasing that awareness and decreasing those resources uh, throughout the student campus. Uh, if you remember some of the uh, my presentation, I mentioned that I have made a connection with a reverend and a pastor. They also provide uh, yoga classes uh, every week and from what I've heard, the feedback that I've received is highly attended by the Dreamers at, uh, at Delaware State University. And I hope that uh, that answers your question. One more question is, um, how do you recruit students for the group counseling sessions, the group therapy, while still being sensitive to um, the not um, disclosing a student's status or confidentiality when you do the recruitment for that? In, 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 in my case, I do not necessarily perform recruitment um, I know that um, we have 145 undocumented students who have been blessed with the, the Dream That US scholarship. So not only I use a mass email communication, I've, I've created an organization on their Blackboard. So every time I post announcements, they'll get the, the, the email uh, about it. Um, and of course, I share the information of the licensed counselor. And then I, myself, I pretty much manage the logistics of, of the, where the group session will be held, the hours. I do provide information about the Delaware's license, um, about the licensed counselor. Previous to her being engaged with the program and the undocumented students, we had a, a couple of conversations to kind of just, you know, perform the logistics for the group sessions and make sure that she understand what it is to speak to un uh, undocumented students. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And one last question, and, and then we'll wrap up with resources, because uh, we know we're about five minutes out of time now. It's how do you, uh, for all these activities and workshops that you're providing for students, many of our students are have little time because they work two or three jobs while they go to school. So how do you provide mental health services for a working population of students? Or do you? Um, our, I'm, a lot of our sessions here are, the times vary. Um, and that's one of, one of the reasons why. Yeah, there is a lot of stuff done during the common hour where the majority of students are on campus and that's between 11 and 12 and it's usually no, no classes on, on campus are scheduled on Tuesday and Thursday during that time. Um, and a lot of the other sessions are held in the evening. And I also, I also want to share with you guys that the peer counselors program at Delaware State, uh, Delaware State University, we have two dreamers, uh, two un undocumented students who are peer counselors at Delaware State University. Five, actually, I'm sorry. <laughs> she gave me the, uh, it's five. Uh, so we have five. And so when we do group sessions, um, especially, you know, we're talking about undocumented students, they are fully engaged in those um, group sessions. 
And I also want to answer a question about how to reach out to undocumented students in the pre-K to eighth population. I've, I did a webinar with the Delaware Department of Education, not only increasing awareness about the opportunities that we have here at DSU for undocumented students, but also we talked about a little bit uh, about mental health. And again, I, I, I go back to the significance of doing networking near your area so you can start connecting with people that can support your, un, your un, undocumented student population at your institution. And also the peer council program is a paid program. They are paid. Right, that's wonderful. Yes. Uh, so let, let's go on to the last slide so we can let everyone go. Um, uh, again, we will share via the chat box a uh, copy to the PowerPoint. So please put in, uh, sit down if you could please put in the chat box again, the copy is PowerPoint. So you have all these different resources uh, uh, regarding scholarships or legal or mental health resources. All of, it, all of that goes kind of in a package to help undocumented students. So organizations like Form Immigrant, National Immigration Law Center, Immigrants Rising, the Dream.us, our own page. And specifically this um, link that you see from United We Dream, that will take you to a um, PDF of specific tips and resources that you can hand out to students. And all those tips are related to strengthening the mental health of undocumented people. So I highly recommend that you uh, reach, um, that you look at the link for the, from United with Dream. It's, it's a list that has been put together by the California Psychological Association. And with that, um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for caring so deeply about our students and about all undocumented students. And uh, again, we will share this information with you in a day or two, the recording and, uh, and these resources. And have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye everybody. And thank you, Kevin and uh, Elizabeth and everyone. And uh, Bye, everyone. thank you so much. Bye. 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 Really appreciate your time. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.